joining us this evening. The structure of tonight's event will first be an introduction, then a talk from author Doug Hawking, and lastly, some time to answer any questions and take comments. If you have any technical difficulties, feel free to type it in the chat box. Um, I'll assist you there. And to ask any questions or make comments, please type it in the chat box or that uh, Q&A box you see, and we will address them there at the appropriate time. Mm -hmm. All right, we have about 40 people with us. That's excellent. Thank you all for being here. In 2018, Doug won Spur Award finalist from Western Writers of America and a co-founders award from Westerners International from Tom Jeffords, Friend of Coaches, a biography. He has twice been awarded the Danielson Prize for Best Program. His history of the relationship of Kit Carson and the Hickory Apache Terror on the Santa Fe Trail has won the Will Rogers Medallion and a co-founders award and was also a Spur finalist. Although his roots are in Cornwall and New England, Doug grew up on the Hickory Apache Reservation in North Central New Mexico. The Rio Riva, where he still maintains close ties to friends, Paisano and Indio, it is a land of mystery, miracles, and penitentes. Doug served in the US Army in military intelligence and armored cal cavalry. He spent many years in the Far East and speaks Chinese. He holds advanced degrees in American history, social anthropology, and historical archeology. span He writes both history and historical fiction. Please welcome Doug Hawking. Thank you very kindly. We call this Terror on the Santa Fe Trail. We call this Terror on the Santa Fe Trail uh, because the Hickory of Apache were able to strike terror in hearts in Santa Fe by closing the Santa Fe Trail. Now, at one talk, I had somebody ask me, what do you mean by close the Santa Fe Trail? Well, three times they, they did it. Uh, the mail parties stopped moving. The wagon trains stopped moving. During the first years of their association with the United States. OK, Deborah, put on share. OK. And Deborah. Close that. Thanks. You can see that their range. Excuse me a second. Okay. Uh, you can see that they own their range covered southeast Colorado, northeast New Mexico, a lot of which later became the Maxwell land grant. Uh, and so they owned the last third of the Santa Fe Trail, whether you went by the uh, Cimarron cutoff or the mountain road, the mountain branch. During this time, Kit Carson was by turns their enemy, their neighbor and friend, their Indian agent, and finally, he led their last war party. I won't be able to go into all the battles that the Hickory have fought, most of which you haven't heard about. Uh, I enjoy writing about them as a former armored cavalry officer. I think I do a fair job of it. Um, most of this, the action happened before the Civil War, and there weren't many reporters in New Mexico. Word wasn't getting back east. The Hickorya were Plains Apache. They lived in teepees. They hunted buffalo. They brought the products of the plains, salt, buffalo hides, and buffalo meat, to the villages of New Mexico. Their teepees were also pitched between those villages and they were an important part of the New Mexico economy. 
Their baskets were prized and they were tightly woven, the best in the Southwest. And with a little bit of effort, you could actually make them hold water. But their pottery was even more important. It was micaceous. You can see the mica sparkling in that pot. The mica has an interesting effect. It spreads heat. And in consequence, these pots don't crack when exposed to direct flame. That was important for New Mexico, which was metal poor, especially iron. People didn't have pots and pans. Uh, I mean, we're talking so metal poor that one of New Mexico's finest crafts, tinsmithing, is based on tin cans that came over the Santa Fe Trail. From the start, there were minor difficulties between Americans and the Hickoria. The Mexican community of New Mexico knew that the Hickoria were all around them, uh, that they were sort of isolated, and that their governors didn't have the wherewithal to do much about minor depredations. So why annoy the governor by complaining that the Hickoria have done something to you? They kept quiet, but Anglos are a little different. And they tend to let everything, uh, not take the loss of a horse lightly. On two occasions, Anglos observed Mexican governors turning over Mexicans who had wronged the Hickoria to the Hickoria for punishment. Uh, again, that is something that Anglos weren't likely to let happen. Janet Lecompte, a writer I really respect, said that the problem might have started with James Kirker, the scalp hunter. Kirker was a former mountain man, and he recruited a small army of mountain men actually many of whom were Delaware Indians. These folks had tribal names like Canarsie and Rockaway, which if you know New York geography, you know are neighborhoods in New York City. Uh, the Delaware got pushed west. They started trading beaver hides, uh, beaver skins and other hides with the, uh, the Dutch and they got pushed west, virtually exterminating the beaver in the east, uh, and eventually ended up being about half the mountain men, though we don't know their stories because they didn't write. So Kirker recruits this army. He's going to get paid for Apache scalps by the governor of Chihuahua for reasons I can't understand. He headed north uh, toward Taos. And there, the Hickory stole about half his horses. Using the other half, he and his men went after the Hickory, cut them off, chased them back to ranchos de Taos, where the plaza became a killing ground as the Apache tried to get into the church and sanctuary. They say about 40 of them died before the killing stopped. Kirker was much in demand as an army scout later in the 40s and uh, in the early 50s, and a scout against the Hickory. And Lecompte thought that this might be why the Hickory had a special hostility for Anglos. 1846, the Mexican-American War. The Plains Indians noticed that the army was no longer guarding the wagon trains, and they began to talk war. There was confusion in New Mexico. Carney came in and made everybody a US citizen. He had no right, there was no treaty yet. He appointed a civilian governor, Bent, who was murdered in Taos. A new civilian governor was appointed, and after that, we had military governors. New Mexico was not yet a territory. Congress squabbled uh, over sectional rights, 
and couldn't come to an agreement about setting New Mexico up as a territory. It wasn't until 1850, that the compromise of 1850, that New Mexico actually became a territory. Add to the confusion, Santa Ana had promised the Texans that he would pull back across the Rio Grande. Albuquerque, Santa Fe, and Taos are all on the Texas side of the Rio Grande. Texas sent out county officials to govern New Mexico as a county of Texas. In Santa Fe, this was greeted as comic opera. Carney, in September of 46, met with the Hickoria at Abiquiu. One of his men recorded the oral treaty, which said, in effect, if you don't depredate, you don't kill us, we will trade with you and we will stop killing you. The Hickoria agreed that this was probably a pretty good idea. And there was peace until 48. In 48, the Hickoria closed the trail for the first time. Lucian Maxwell was coming down from Pueblo. Let's Lucian Maxwell of the Maxwell Land Grant. <clears throat> He's bringing a string of uh, pack animals carrying hides he traded from the Ute. And when he got to Raton Pass, he found the Hickory had camped at the foot. Over a hundred warriors, he thought. Now, given that about one in five Hickory was a warrior, uh, we're looking at most of the tribe which consisted of somewhere between 800 and 1300 individuals. Lucian was turned back. He went back up to Pueblo. Pueblo was a trading post founded by Mountain Wen, their Taos wives and Tausenio relatives. And they had decided that it wasn't working. The Indian trade was down. So when Lucian went back, a group of folks from Pueblo went with him. They got to Raton Pass and were turned back again, chased by the Hickoria. There's a wonderful story of a woman with babe in arms, charging away on her horse, followed by the Hickoria, and the men are screaming to her, throw the baby away, save yourself. She comes to an arroyo and the horse leaps over barely making it to the far side, hooves collapsing the bank on the far side, the hickory are turning back, their ponies too small to leap. And as she goes across, she hears a crack in the baby's neck. The child will wear his head cocked to one side for the rest of his life, a testament to his mother's love. Lucian now headed for Bent's Fort and with about 15 men, he headed south again with the intent of going through Manco Buro Pass, about six miles east of Raton, sneaking past the Hickoria, undetected, except they were detected. And a fight ensued. And there are some wonderful heroic stories. Um, Lucian, unconscious, being carried up the cliff face uh, by his servant, uh, heroism on all hands, and, and they make it across the mountains to Taos. The army now notified that the Hickory have closed the pass, take out after them. Meanwhile, Kit Carson, promoted to lieutenant by Fremont out in California, and Lieutenant Brewerton are making a hard crossing over the old Spanish trail crossing the Grand River, what we call the Colorado today. On two rafts, they lose one raft. On that raft are uh, several of their rifles, most of their powder and shot, all of their food, and three men's pants. On the far side of the river, the first help they'll meet will be in New Mexico. There's no place to shop. They can't hunt because they haven't got enough ammunition. Take a look at that picture of Kit. It was taken just after he reached Washington with dispatches. 
If you compare it to other pictures of him, you'll realize that he's lost about 40 pounds. That's how hard that crossing was. So here he is with his, with his crew of, of scarecrows coming into New Mexico when he crosses the path of a war party. Burton says, how do you know it's a war party? Kit says, there are no travois, therefore no women and children. If it's you, we'll be okay. But if it's Hickorya, we're in trouble. How did Kit know the Hickorya were at war? I have no idea. Kit heads south, hugging the mountains, and runs into a Hickorya camp. He backs his men off into the trees, gets the horses up in the trees where they'll be hard to reach, lines his men up. If you can imagine these scarecrows facing the Hickorya, some of them without guns, three of them without pants. And now they're going to grin the bear out of the tree. They're saved when a Hickorya comes racing up and talks to his chief and the Hickorya take off. Unbeknownst to Kit, the Missouri mounted volunteers have arrived from over the mountain and they're chasing the Hickorya. They go across the Rio Grande and up into the high mountains and there at Cumbres Pass in July of 48, they fight a battle. And again, the Hickorya are said to have lost about 40 warriors. Things are calm uh, for the next year or so. The Missouri Mounted Volunteers go home with the end of the Mexican-American War, and they're replaced by the regular army. The Hickorya come to Las Vegas to trade. Unfortunately, they want to trade for powder and shot and aguardiente. Lieutenant Ambrose Burnside, he of the sideburns, is sent out to determine if they're hostile or not. He determines that they are. And in the ensuing fight, he's wounded in the neck, his sergeant's wounded. <coughs> 14 Hickory are slain and six captured. I'm gonna skip ahead a little bit and explain about Lobo Blanco's daughter. She's among the captured. In October, Ann White and her baby daughter, Virginia, are taken captive by the Hickorya. And there will be, we'll talk about that in a moment. There will be a number of attempts to get her back. Burnside's commander proposes that they uh, send out a party with Lobo Blanco's daughter to make the trade. And the powers in Santa Fe turn them down. I cannot find where that order was ever reversed, which might explain why Lobo Blanco's daughter goes out uh, with a mail party uh, under Burnside's sergeant. And they get to Wagon Mound, where they take her up to the top with the intent that she'll see the smoke of the Hickorya camp and can guide them to the Hickorya camp where an exchange can be made she starts singing her death song. They come back down, everybody creeped out. And the next morning she grabs a knife off one of the soldiers, uh, slashes two soldiers, slashes a mule, kills another. And then a soldier panics and blows off her head. She is now unacceptable for trade. So what brought this on? Well, the last wagon train of the season under FX Aubrey, the skimmer of the plains, he who rode from Santa Fe to Independence in five and a half days is leading out that last wagon train. With him is James White, his wife, Anne, and baby daughter, Virginia. In late October, they have passed the most dangerous tribes, they think. The weather's getting cold. The baby has the sniffles. James wants to take two horse-drawn Dearborn wagons that'll go much faster than the oxen-drawn uh, Conestogas, the big wagons. 
and head into Santa Fe. FX advises against it. Nonetheless, James takes off with a party of nine and is a day or two ahead of the wagon train with his two wagons near Point of Rocks when he runs into the Hickoria. The Hickoria say we're just there to collect the toll. That is, make us gifts and you can cross our land in peace. One of the white men panics and shoots a Hickoria. And within moments, all of the uh, white men are dead and the uh, women and the baby are captives. The Hickoria take off with them. Uh, it's believed this is Lobo Blanco's band. The army is slow to organize. They send out uh, a trader with an offer of $1,000 worth of trade goods uh, for the woman. He can't find the Hickory at camp. About a month later, they finally organize uh, a military expedition at Taos, a company of dragoons, uh, and a company of spies and guides made up of Mexican ciballeros, uh, buffalo hunters, uh, Taos Indians, and mountain men under a uh, renowned scout, Antoine LaRue. Major Greer takes his small army and two cannon, takes his small army across the mountains to Rayado where Kit is living. He wants Kit as a guide and Kit says, no, you've got Antoine LaRue. He's as good as I am. The major says, your country is depending on you. Kit says, I'm at peace with the Hickoria. They come by, I feed them. I give them a few head of cattle. They're happy. I'm happy. No problem. Major Greer says, the woman's depending on you. And Kit can't resist this. It turns out that Kit is the only one who can find this month old trail. It has snowed in the interim. And they head into the breaks of the Canadian River, 950 foot deep canyon, lots of places for, uh, for ambush. And Kit follows the trail for 200 miles down to the vicinity of Tumacacari Butte, excuse me, Tucumcari Butte. There he smells smoke and he tells Major Greer, I'll go ahead. When I spot the camp, I'll signal everyone to charge. We'll get in there before they can hurt the woman. The major agrees. Kit takes off, spots the camp, signals the charge, and realizes no one's with him. Behind him, the major has been hit by a spent round. It hits him in heavy gloves, knocking him from his horse. Antoine LaRue has been arguing that they should negotiate, now comes up to the major and says, we need to negotiate, and the major agrees. Three times they send out a white flag and three times it's fired on as the Hickoria escape with their horses across the Canadian River, leaving behind their winter supplies, their heavy robes, and their teepees. Finally, the army charges and they take the camp and find the dead body of Ann White still warm. One of the soldiers spots a book, Kit Carson, Prince of the Gold Hunters, and starts to read it. And Kit begs him to stop. If the woman had read that, she would have expected me to come and save her. The little girl, Virginia, uh, is not found in the camp. For 15 years, the reward will remain in place for her return. And in the next 15 years, she will have more sightings than Elvis pumping gas at the 7-Eleven. Kit returns home to Rayado, and for the first time, the Hickoria uh, raid Rayado and steal some of his cattle. Uh, there's an incident, uh, the army assists him 
in getting them back and the soldiers scalp some hickory uh, and later they'll try and claim that it was civilians that were with them. In May, the trail is closed for the third time with an attack on a mail party. The mail party's overdue. It's gone all the way to Kansas and it's on the way back. But with spring flooding uh, and mud, the overdue nature is, is not worried about too much until somebody happens upon the dead bodies of the 11 men. They piece together the story. The Hickoria ambushed them at the rock crossing of the Cimarron. Uh, and chased them for 20 miles, wounding two of them who were put in a wagon. And the next morning they tried to escape thinking the Indians might leave in the night. Uh, they didn't and the party is overwhelmed. Everyone had thought that 11 armed men would be safe. And now the mail parties won't move and the wagon trains won't move. The Hickory are pursued by the army. There are a number of battles throughout the spring and summer. And finally, in the fall, they're ready for, for peace. Governor Calhoun had been the Indian agent and now becomes governor. He knows what's going on and he asks Washington, what sort of treaty can I make with these people? But he can't get any instructions uh, from Washington. Finally, on April 2, uh, without instruction, he makes a treaty with Chief Chacon. The Hickoria will submit unconditionally. They'll be told where to live. They'll abstain from murder and depredation. And they'll keep back 50 miles from all trails and villages. There will be military posts and traders on their land. There will be trade regulations. And in return, the governor, the government will give them whatever it feels like. The Hickory have promised everything and in return get nothing. The treaty, despite its entirely one-sided nature, is never ratified sectional difficulties in Congress and hostility between the House and Senate, the House where all spending bills are supposed to originate and Indian treaties which call for spending. Um, so the treaty isn't ratified. The Hickoria will essentially follow this treaty for the next nine years uh, in all particulars except one. Originally, there's panic when the Hickory come to town to trade. And shortly after, it's realized that their economy depends on it. And furthermore, there's no place in their range where they can be more than 50 miles from any trail or town. Um, but if the treaty isn't ratified by the Senate, and one side is expected to obey it and does, is that treaty broken? I'm sure the Hickory has saw it that way. In the summer of 51, Colonel Sumner comes out with orders to economize. He takes out one expedition against the Navajo and in the process ends up losing almost all of his horses. He comes to the remarkable conclusion that only infantry can fight Indians. He tells this to Washington. They like the idea. Uh, Infantry, you give them a bayonet and you feed one soldier. With cavalry, you got to provide a saddle, a saber, a horse tack, and a horse, and you got to feed the horse. So um, Congress has always been in favor of infantry. Sumner, the army is renting quarters in the towns where they're close to defend the people. Sumner decides that to save money, he's going to build forts. He's going to take the men far outside the towns and he'll be able to graze his livestock. Um, expense building forts and then uh, there's a drought and he can't feed his livestock. So he has to send uh, for feed. Uh, transportation costs go up. 
uh, and he kills off most of his horses. Calhoun dies on the way back to Washington. Um, and is replaced. And the new governor, William Carlane, is appointed just after the election of 52. Uh, the Whig president has been replaced with a Democrat, but it will be months before the new administration takes office. And so Carlane is sent out to be treaty, and he's a lame uh, to be governor, and he is a lame duck. Nonetheless, he tries to do some good things. And he exceeds his authority on a couple. But uh, he makes treaties with the Chiricahua and with the Hickorya. And both the Chiricahua and the Hickorya take up farming, the Hickorya near Abiquiu. And he promises them supplemental rations until they can feed themselves, tools, and training. The Hickorya dig irrigation ditches along the Rio Puerco. They get farms started. The tools and training are supplied from supplemental funds uh, that the governor has, uh, and he provides the supplemental rations. The treaty is not ratified by Congress. And then two things happen. For the first time in living memory, Rio Puerco dries up. And then the money, the supplemental money uh, uh, in the governor's funds dries up as well. Governor David Merriweather arrives. By the way, we get General Garland in July of 53. Garland immediately tells Washington, I've got to rebuild the army. Uh, David Merriweather arrives in September 53. Merriweather, consummate bureaucrat, appoints his son-in-law as the Indian agent for the Hickorio. And both of them agree, uh, being good bureaucrats, they know that you don't want to ask Congress for money. That will make you unpopular. And if you get Congress to adopt your predecessor's treaty, it will be a Whig treaty, not a Democrat treaty. Uh, it will be your predecessor's treaty, not yours. So instead, he takes the bureaucrats route and he says, it's all my predecessor's fault. And as soon as we stop feeding the Apache, there will be a war. And his son-in-law echoes him and nothing happens. In the spring of 53, Kit Carson was appointed agent for the Hickory and Ute. Kit was off in California, didn't come home until Christmas of 54, and thus didn't take office until January of 54. Out near Barclays Fort, which is near the town of Watrous, uh, Barclay had worked for the Bents, and he built a fort like theirs to trade with their Indians. Um, the army had tried to take it away from him to use as their own fort. Uh, they lost that battle and ended up with Fort Union eight miles to the north. Nonetheless, Watrous set up in the area with a ranch supplying, supplying livestock and beef to the army. Watrous is one of those guys who cannot bear a single loss. There's a minor incident of March of 54. We have starving Hickorya, and they steal two horses from Watrous. The record says that his herders were insulted. You can read that is they were beaten up by the Hickorya, who took off with the horses. The army responds. Lieutenant David Bell is sent out with 30 dragoons. Dragoons are cavalry. They are trained to fight from, from horseback with horse pistol and saber or dismounted with musketoon, a shortened musket. They're not mounted infantry. Mounted infantry only fight on the ground. They ride to the battle. Uh, dragoons fight both ways. They're sent out with orders from Colonel uh, Philip St. George Cook 
usually a good man and a an excellent Indian fighter, but the orders that he gives to Bell are bound to cause a fight. No way that they can. Go out and surround the camp, make them give up uh, the guilty parties, the marauders, and then whip them and take back the horses. And if they won't give up the marauders, then take four chiefs as hostages and take double the number of horses as an indemnity. Well, the Hickory aren't about to put up with this. And indeed, this leads to a fight. Bell goes out um, beyond the Canadian River and meets uh, Lobo Blanco, who's blamed for, for the death of Anne White. A fight ensues. A couple of uh, dragoons are killed. A number of Hickorya are killed. And Lobo Blanco himself dies. Lobo Blanco takes more killing than Rasputin. Bell is now a hero. It's hard to bring the Indians to a fight um, when they don't want it. So uh, Bell is a hero. And now we get Lieutenant Davidson entering the scene from California, uh, fresh from massacring California Indians. The Hickorya show up at Mora, um, the base of the pass to go over to Taos. They show up in strength. Davidson himself counts 107 warriors. But the Hickorya say, we're not part of that Lobo Blanco bunch. We want peace. We've always been peaceful. And indeed, it appears that they mean it. He takes four of their chiefs and takes them over to Taos, where they talk with the military commander and with Kit Carson. <clears throat> Kit goes off to Santa Fe to try and get the governor to provide rations for a starving people. Davidson takes his four captives to Fort Union, where he stays overnight with Bell and Cook and insults them. He says, the hickory are nothing. Give me 60 men and I'll exterminate the entire tribe. He now heads back for Taos. The Hickory have crossed over to Picurus. They are told to stay put there. In fact, they move five or six miles to a regular campsite where they go to make pottery. And that is what they've done. But the army thinks they've disappeared. So Davidson is sent to find them. His orders gain and maintain contact. Don't bring on an action. Don't let them cross the Rio Grande. In the early morning hours, he, he spots their fires on a spur <clears throat> of the mountain above Ojo Caliente Canyon uh, at 8,000 feet. They're not trying to hide. He can see their fires. Davidson heads up the canyon. What happens next is a subject of dispute. Go on ahead. <clears throat> Bell interviews the soldiers. He wasn't there. And he says, Davidson uh, panicked at one point and told his men to mount and save themselves. Uh, he also says that Davidson brought on an action against a peaceful camp. Davidson demanded a court of inquiry but by the time it comes around, Bell is back east at Leavenworth, and Davidson acts as his own prosecutor. He calls the witnesses, and he calls three of his own men, and even they can't agree. Davidson said, from the Hickory voice, from the Hickory camp came a voice that said, uh, come up if you want to fight. We're ready for you. One of his men said it was in Spanish. Another said that the cry was in perfect English and another in broken English and still another says, I didn't hear anything at all. Davidson sounds the charge and up the steep hillside they go. 
and pretty quick have to dismount and drag their horses. And before long, they realize they can't drag them any further. So a fourth of the command, the number four, is the horse holders are left behind. <clears throat> and Davidson continues in two platoons into the Hickory camp, which he finds empty. From down below comes a cry. They're stealing the horses. And he heads back down the mountainside. And along the way, five men die. The Hickory are now having them in a bowl. They have cover and concealment. They attack from all sides, moving from one side to the other. High angle arrow fire from unseen archers. The men are getting wounded. Uh, Davidson may have panicked at this point. In any event, they attempt to escape up the uh, far side of the canyon and going up uh, a ragtag bunch, uh, wounded men in the saddle, uh, wounded men hanging on to stirrups. Uh, they go up the other side and now he fights a rear guard action, having to fight on all four sides as he heads for the Rio Grande uh, and finally arrives down to his last four rounds of ammunition when the Hickorya break contact. Davidson went in with 60 dragoons. He left 22 dead behind him. 36 were wounded. The official record says 24, other accounts say 36. I think 36 because Davidson was wounded in the back and the man he sent for help had an arrow through his leg. Down to four rounds, the Hickorya could have finished them off. It would have been like Custer's last stand, but they didn't want the fight to begin with and they broke contact. They had 107 warriors. They left behind two dead and one wounded. When Davidson talked about this at his court of inquiry, the Hickorya suddenly had 300 warriors and then he realized that they didn't have that many, even if all the Hickorya were there. So he invented some youth to fight alongside them. It's said at that court that, that Kit Carson sided with him. Uh, Kit's answers were entirely equivocal. He didn't call Davidson a liar, but he didn't really confirm anything that he said. Panic uh, arises now, a good part of the army in, in New Mexico is lying dead. And acting Governor Missouri, Meriwether is off in Washington looking for another job. Acting Governor Missouri declares war on the Hickorya. Now, I didn't know territorial governors, even acting ones, had that authority. But nonetheless, Missouri does it. Kit Carson is recruited by the Army, still the uh, Hickory agent. He's recruited as scout and guide. They put together two companies of dragoons and Taos along with a company of spies and guides, and they head off across the uh, winter runoff, spring runoff, uh, freezing Rio Grande, and then south through mud and snow four feet deep in the shadows. They come in over the saddle uh, to the Via Cetos. Uh, you can see roughly at the middle of the picture an area where the cliffs along the river have broken down. And this is where the Hickorya camp is. The Hickorya set up a rear guard action in the rocks and the army attacks while the women and children withdraw across the Via Cetos. Five or six Hickory are killed. We don't know the exact number because some of them disappeared into the Viacitos. In the ensuing days, as the army pursues toward Abiquiu, 15, mostly women and children, will die of exposure. By the time they get to Abiquiu, Kit Carson has a letter written for him to Miss Servi. The Apaches about Taos were driven to war by the actions of the officers and troops. It's Davidson's fault. 
he attacked a peaceful camp. He called for a just treaty to be made with the Hickoria, to which acting governor Missouri replied, we can't have a treaty, we just declared war. I thought that's how you ended a war, but apparently Miss Servi was unaware. The fighting and killing and pursuit goes on through numerous battles throughout the spring and summer. And in the fall, there's a peace treaty. Meriwether is back. Now, Meriwether's account of the treaty is so bizarre uh, that some things, people think there were actually two different treaties, but the timeline says the only time this could have occurred was October of 54. It is traditional to feed the Indians while they're there and to provide them with gifts, new blankets and such. Meriwether shows up with old blankets and old coats. One of the youth chiefs who attends is so annoyed that he tears his coat in half. Treaty negotiations break down. There's a scare. They think the Navajo are attacking. They think that Meriwether has sold them out. In any event, they take off for home and the Ute chiefs who got the coats come down with smallpox. I don't like Meriwether, but I'd hate to think any American governor would have done that. Perhaps they went through a Mexican village where there was smallpox on the way home. Nonetheless, the Ute are now at war. And in December, on Christmas Day, the Ute and Hickory will attack Pueblo. Pueblo at this point has eight families living there. The relatives of the mountain men and their wives who have left they have let the place fall into disrepair, the gates off its hinges, and the hickory kill just about everyone. This is why the area is abandoned for the next nine years. And this is why Pueblo isn't the oldest town in uh, Colorado. The army gathers uh, at Fort Massachusetts, one of the most remote posts in the United States, 90 miles north of Taos. They have difficulty uh, supplying it in the winter. And in fact, very often abandon the post in the winter. Two campaigns go out and you can read about the battles of Sawachi and Pancho uh, Pass. Uh, the army pursues, comes back to recruit, pursues again. And then the New Mexico volunteers under Saran St. Frain take over and they pursue the Hickory into New Mexico and continue fighting them through the spring and summer. And finally, in the fall, Meriwether is ready to make a treaty. It is essentially the same treaty that Carlane made, but now it's got his name on it. Now it belongs to a Democrat uh, administration. And even so, the Senate does not ratify Kit Carson will remain the agent of the Hickory until 1861, when he resigns to take up the commission of a colonel in the New Mexico Volunteers. During that time, he and Meriwether will fight continuously. In fact, Meriwether will try to get him in trouble, try to fire him. Uh, Kit says, you can't fire me. Uh, the president appointed me. Uh, and so it goes. Kit objects to Meriwether's treaty. It can't work. And folks say, what happened in the 18 months since he was saying, make a just treaty with these people? Why is he saying now they won't obey him? Uh, well, my conclusion is that given that Kit and Meriwether are extremely hostile to each other, and that this is the same treaty that Meriwether said couldn't work, the Kit's now putting it in Meriwether's eye. Yeah, you're right. It can't work. It's the same treaty. It, you said it wouldn't work. It won't work. <clears throat> in the Civil War, uh, Kit fights the Confederates at Val Verde uh, and then rounds up the Mescalero and takes them to uh, Bosque Redondo, which his commander, Carlton, 
thinks will make excellent agricultural ground. And indeed, if you go there today, you can see that it's all farms. Uh, they're planning a good thing that just doesn't work out for a number of reasons. Kit now is told to round up the Navajo. He's asking for leave. He has injuries. Uh, Carlton says, when you bring the first group of Navajo to Santa Fe, you can go home on leave. Kit rounds up the Navajo. He never enters. Um, uh, yeah, he never enters the canyon himself uh, during his time uh, as commander. Only six Navajo are killed. He takes 200 uh, on the long walk to Santa Fe and none of them die on the way. He now goes home on leave and several months later, he'll be back as uh, Indian agent at Bosque Redondo. Uh, for a variety of reasons, he soon hates the job and resigns from it. Uh, he is now asked to take out a force against the Comanche. Kit recruits 100 Hickorya and Ute as his spies and guides. And they head out on the plains to an area north of uh, Amarillo uh, along the Canadian River. And there they overwhelm a Kiowa camp and proceed toward Adobe Walls, a place that Kit built as a trading post for the Bents. Uh, beyond that, about three miles south of this spot, uh, they meet up with the Comanche and uh, it becomes clear to Kit that there's more Comanche than he can handle. His officers are somewhat irritated uh, as he doesn't ask them. He goes to his Hickory and Youth Scouts and says, what should we do? And they say, withdraw. And Kit fights an excellent you know, fighting withdrawal and saves his army. The Hickorya, meanwhile, will be the last tribe to get a reservation. They're living at Abiquiu and at Cimarron where they're farming, but they're not wanted. They get told, go away, go somewhere else. And uh, it's difficult for them. In 68, uh, the Ute are going to see President Grant, and they suggest that the Hickorya, that they send some people along with them. The Hickorya and Ute are two entirely different tribes. In fact, you can see the Hickorya are taller than the Ute, um, but they're intermarried. In fact, the top Ute chief uh, has a Hickorya mother. And they go to see President Grant, and a reservation is suggested the one here marked 1880, roughly, but it's too close to the recently occupied Tierra Amaria Grant. The owners don't want the Hickoria nearby. So that falls apart. And in 74, Grant uh, signs an executive order creating the reservation marked 1874 uh, at the edge of Navajo country along the San Juan River. But that's still too close for the folks in the Tierra Amaria Grant. And that falls apart. In 1880, a new executive order goes back to the original reservation. But before they can occupy, the Hickory are asked to go to Mescalero. The first chief to go down there with 30 of his people has his livestock stolen by uh, Lincoln County outlaws. Can you spell Billy the Kid? And he tells the others, this is a bad place, don't come. In fact, the Hickory get down there with 800 people. There are 400 Mescalero. All the tribal cops are Mescalero. All the best land is taken by the Mescalero. The Hickory are put on bad land. The Mescalero complain they overhunt. The uh, Hickory are so far from schools that they have to board their children. Finally, in 1886, sick and tired of it, they asked the governor, hey, what if we give up being a tribe can we become settlers and take homesteads? And the governor says, yeah, I think that's how it works. And so they 
mount a brilliant operation and kidnap their children from boarding school and take off north to be homesteaders, pursued by the same army officers that pursued Geronimo. People are in panic. And the officers are sending messages that said, these people have been deeply wrong. They haven't done anything. They're not causing trouble. Uh, we have an army very sympathetic to the Hickoria. And finally, in 1887, they get the reservation where they are today, the last tribe to get a reservation. Thanks. Yeah, stop the share. There you go. You got it. <laughs> Thank you so much, Doug. That was an awesome presentation. Um, so if anyone has any questions, you can type it in the chat box. I can ask it for you or you can raise your hand and I'll and uh, you can ask yourself. Sandra Smith, you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment. Sandra, I see your hand raised um, and you can unmute yourself if you'd like to ask a question. Sandra. Uh, Joy, you have your hand raised. You can unmute yourself if you'd like. Hi, Joy. Long time no see. <laughs> uh, Doug, can you hear me? Yeah, I sure can. Okay, great. That was a wonderful presentation. And um, I'm hoping that the Santa Fe Public Library will share it with others. I um, tried to get the word out to people who are members of our Santa Fe Trail Association that you were giving this presentation again. And I was delighted to see that you added to it and expanded. And um, anyway, wonderful, wonderful presentation on the Hickoria and, um, and your wonderful research. Well, thank, thank you so much. And uh, I was glad to see your message and I hope to listen in on your talk. And Joy, uh, we are recording or we have been recording the event and we'll have it up on the Santa Fe Public Library YouTube channel um, as soon as we have that processed. Great, thank you. Thank you. If anyone else has any comments or questions, feel free to raise your hand, write it in the chat box or Q&A. Sandra, down in the lower left-hand corner of the screen is a thing that looks like a microphone. If you click on it, that will unmute you. Well, if we don't have any more questions, um, make sure you visit Doug Hawking's website, DougHawking.com. You'll find all of his books there. Um, you'll find a book that was addressed tonight for purchase there. Um, you can also request to purchase them through your local bookstores. Um, thank you so much, Doug. And thank you everyone for being here this evening. This is a great presentation. And thank you for having me. Yeah. Everyone stay safe, read books, and have a good night.